Reluctant Preppers provides educational awareness and commentary only. Opinions expressed do not constitute personalized financial advice. Viewers are encouraged to do their own research and seek qualified personal financial consultation before making investment decisions. Does your family ever get exasperated with you for stockpiling such things as paper towels, bottled water, or toilet tissue? Well, they certainly can't object to you stockpiling money. Silver, the only money recognized by the U.S. Constitution. And your first 10-ounce bar of pure silver can be had at spot price with no premium by going to sdbullion.com rp. And when you buy it that way, you'll be supporting Reluctant Preppers as well by going to sdbullion.com rp. Thanks. Hey, Reluctant Preppers. If you haven't heard, we've already started our monthly one ounce U.S. Silver Eagle thank you gift to one active Patreon subscriber each month, signed by your host, Donegan Kaiser. And you don't want to miss out on that. Please help us grow by subscribing today at patreon.com slash reluctant preppers. As a responsible person with growing concerns for your privacy and personal liberty, you want to know where we're headed and what you can do about it. We ask the experts what you need to do to take prudent and responsible action to safeguard your family's wealth and well-being and what basic first steps will help you to be aware and prepared. ReluctantPreppers.com Welcome back, Reluctant Preppers. We're privileged to have a first-time guest this evening. Dr. Edwin Vieira is a constitutional attorney. He's done research and writing on the Second Amendment rights. He's a He's studied firearms law at the constitutional level and has lectured about this extensively. Dr. Vieira, thank you for joining us here on Reluctant Preppers. My pleasure to be with you. I wanted to mention for all our viewers that today is October 25th, 2018. We actually were put in contact with you through our mutual acquaintance, D.V. Kidd, who uh, appeared a couple times on our show, and she highly recommends you as having a depth of knowledge in this subject matter about uh, firearm rights and constitutionality. And when I spoke with you about this earlier, you mentioned that there can be quite a uh, bit of misinformation and misconceptions when people talk about our constitutional rights to bear arms and uh, our our uh, all of our rights around circulating around the Second Amendment to the Constitution. So if you could take time to set the record straight in that regard, I know it's not simple because I've listened to some of your lectures about this online, and I was fascinated at the depth and the precision that you took in, in formulating a better understanding of this. But if you could help us uh, and our viewers to come to a, the grips with this, we'd really appreciate it. Well, one of the problems with the Second Amendment in terms of understanding by the average citizen is that the average citizen really doesn't have a background in constitutional interpretation. So he or she is more likely to pick up some information off the Internet or some other publicly available source and use that as a foundation and then build from that when, in fact, that foundation is really not very stable. Because when you speak about the Constitution, of course, the original Constitution, uh, the initial ratification document, and you speak of the Bill of Rights, many people treat those as really separate documents. So the Second Amendment is in the Bill of Rights as opposed to being in the Constitution explicitly, at least. And therefore, they think there's something of a disjunction there. In fact, a lot of people believe that the Bill of Rights was written to amend the Constitution in really a substantive fashion. Uh, that the Constitution would have, without the Bill of Rights, allowed for certain things to be done by Congress or the executive or, or the judicial system. But the Bill of Rights came along and nullified those apparent powers. Now, that's actually not true. For many of the amendments, from the 11th Amendment on, the amendments actually changed something substantive in the Constitution. Classic example being the 13th Amendment, which prohibits slavery and involuntary servitude except as punishment for crime. Slavery was permitted in the original Constitution. You could have slavery as the result of, until the slave trade ended, uh, slaves being brought into the states and sold as such. You could have slavery as the result of a child being born to a slave. That child automatically became a slave under, I think, every uh, state law in the states that, that had uh, slave populations. So slavery was clearly something that was allowed, 
permitted, maybe reluctantly by the framers in the original Constitution, but it was there, it then becomes prohibited in the 13th Amendment. So the 13th Amendment really does substantively change the Constitution. Now, that's not true of the first ten amendments, the, the Bill of Rights. If you look at what actually happened there, uh, the Bill of Rights was enacted, and I quote, in order to prevent misconstruction or abuse of the Constitution's powers. And that quote comes from the resolution of the first Congress that submitted the amendments to the original 13 states. So we're talking about preventing misconstruction or abuse. So what does that mean? Misconstruction is a situation where someone, as a mistake, interprets the powers of the Constitution incorrectly. Right, we're talking about an innocent mistake. You read a particular provision of the original Constitution, you come to the wrong interpretation of what it means. Abuse, on the other hand, is looking to an intentional misconstruction. You want to expand those powers beyond what the Constitution allows, or perhaps in some instances you want to limit those powers more than the Constitution limits them. So you abuse that construction. So the Bill of Rights was really there as a kind of caveat, simply saying, look, the original Constitution doesn't provide for any of the things that we are saying are prohibited in the Bill of Rights. Don't misconstrue it that way. Don't attempt to abuse those powers. So that's the first thing. So when you look at the mm -hmm. Second Amendment, you have to say, well, the Second Amendment then is not something separate from and independent from the original Constitution. It's really tied in in a very integral fashion. And that's true of all the provisions in the Constitution, as well as in the Bill of Rights. They all have to be interpreted and applied as an integrated whole, in a whole, what I would call a holistic fashion, because the Constitution is a fully integrated concept. There are no provisions in the Constitution, for instance, that negate other provisions in the Constitution. It's not a self-contradictory document. And every power in the Constitution implicitly contains what lawyers call a disability, that is, an absence of power. Right? But if you have an affirmative grant of power, by hypothesis, that grant of power has to be construed in a negative fashion as to all the other possible powers relating to that subject. Right? So if you have, and I'm getting perhaps a little bit ahead of myself, but if you have a power, as you do in the Constitution, to provide for organizing, arming, and disciplining the militia, it should be obvious that that power does not include a power to disarm the militia. The power can't be positive and negative at the same time. Now, when you go to the Thank Second you. Amendment, I think the major problem we have is that the... Um, uh, what shall I call it, the, the, the kind of popular interpretation of the Second Amendment focuses on the last 14 words. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Well, the Second Amendment consists of 27 words, not just 14. And they're all in one sentence. So by any rational reading of the Second Amendment, under the, at least in the English language, you have to put all of those words together in essentially one coherent thought. You can't simply slice the sentence essentially in half, 13 words here and 14 words there, take the last 14 and forget about the first 13. And that's the major problem we have today. As I say, people have come through what I would call popular misunderstanding to focus on those last 14 words. Well, if you look at the Second Amendment, read it, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Now, what's the purpose of that? What's the goal? Well, it's a free state, and specifically the security of a free state. Right? That provision of the Constitution is focusing on that concept. We want a free state, and we want to guarantee its security. And then the amendment tells us the one thing, that anywhere in the Constitution is said to be necessary for that purpose, and it is what? A well-regulated militia. Then the amendment tells us... Correct. Then the amendment tells us that the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. So what I would call the logical reading, simply in the English language, forgetting principles of law here, would be that the right of the people to keep and bear arms is a thing that the Second Amendment is protecting so that we can have a well-regulated militia to provide the security necessary for a free state. That's the sequence, the logical right. sequence, all right? Uh, and as a result of that, what is the key element in it? 
Well, it's this peculiar term, a well-regulated militia. This is the thing that the people are supposed to participate in when they're armed that will have this ultimate good effect. Now, let's tie the Second Amendment back into the original Constitution to see that those two bodies of law are not somehow discordant. Where do we find provisions in the original Constitution dealing with the militia? Well, in three places. Article 1, Section 8, Clause 15. Article 1, Section 8, Clause 16. And Article 2, Section 2, Clause 1. And the two clauses in Article 1 relate to Congress's powers with respect to the militia. And the one clause in Article 2 relates to the status of the President of the United States. Let's start with that one. That says, the President of the United States shall be commander-in-chief of the militia when call, of the militia of the several states when called into the actual service of the United States. Well, that tells us right away that there's more than one militia. Each one of the several states, as the states taken respectively, that's that terminology in the Constitution. Each one of the several states has its own militia. So now there are, what, 15? 50. There were, there were 13 at the beginning. There are now 50. There's one in each state. And those militia can be called into the service of the United States. They're not direct instrumentalities of the government of the United States the way the Army is and the Navy is. They're instrumentalities of the states, which under some circumstances, the United States can call upon for specific services. And those services okay. are, are three. You go back to the powers of Congress power of Congress to provide for calling forth the militia, to execute the laws of the Union, to suppress insurrections, and to repel invasions. Have it right there. Militia can be called to the United States service for those three purposes and no others because, once again, once a power has been stated, we can't add to it, subtract from it, divide it, and so forth and so on. What is there is there. And then Congress is also given the power to provide for organizing, arming, and disciplining the militia. And why is that? Well, because there are, there are 13 of them at the time, or 50 of them now, and the Constitution wanted to be sure that they would be organized, armed, disciplined, which includes training, in a uniform fashion. So that if and when they were called forth to execute the laws of the Union, suppress insurrections, or repel invasions, each one of these militia from each one of the different states would be able to cooperate with the same type of equipment and training and organization and so forth and so on. So it was really looking forward to uniformity. But then on the other hand, it, the militia can be called forth only for those three purposes by the government in Washington. The states could use the militia for essentially anything else they wanted. And so the states could add to that organization, arming, disciplining, and training to provide for things other than executing the laws, suppressing insurrections, and repelling invasions. So we see the two things are tied together, and it's quite logical that you would think that the militia would be necessary to the security of a free state if the militia are performing these particular functions even for the government of the United States. Executing the laws, suppressing insurrections, repelling invasions, you would think that's a pretty short list of things that would be necessary to the security of any state. Right? All right, but this still leaves open the question of, well, what are these things called the militia? Because the Constitution doesn't define them. Well, there are quite a few things the Constitution doesn't define. The Constitution is not a dictionary. All right? Uh, it defines some things. It defines Congress, because the Congress under the Constitution was different from the Congress under the Articles of Confederation, had different structure, different powers, so it had to be defined, the House of Representatives and the Senate. It defines the office of the President, what powers the President has, why? Because there was no equivalent office under the Articles of Confederation. It limits in certain ways the powers of the states, because those limits were not there previously. The one term it does define very clearly is treason. You look at Article 3, Section 3, treason is defined very carefully. Why? Because under the pre-existing English law, and remember the colonies were all part of the British system, so they all operated under English law until Declaration of Independence. Treason was a word that was very broadly defined. And to a large extent, treason was a term that was so broadly defined it could be used as a way of political oppression. You could pretty much define treasons to fit particular people that you wanted to uh, remove from office or to remove from this earth. 
So the founding fathers didn't want that to continue, so they defined treason in a very special manner. But the militia are not defined. And the reason was nobody needed to define them. I would say that every adult male, and that's 16 up through 55, 60 years old, was at the time of the ratification of the Constitution and the ratification of the Second Amendment, which came only a couple of years later, he was either in the militia or he had served in the militia at some time during his life. Perhaps he was too old to serve at that time, but he had served previously. So I found it fascinating when I heard you talk about this in another interview, uh, yeah, actually a lecture that you were giving, that you said, you know, you can stare and stare and stare at the uh, Constitution and get more and more frustrated that it doesn't define militia, but you were able to break out of that and said, well, I'm just going to turn to where it must have been existing and where it was defined. Well, so you look at at the, at the time when these documents were written, they were written for the average American. They weren't written for some you know, law scholar, or certainly weren't written for people in the future. They were written for the people at the time, because the people at the time ratified. And so those people were expected to know what most of the terms meant. They certainly knew what the militia meant. And you could find exact specifications for the structure and operations of the militia in each of the 13 original states in state statutes or colonial statutes, because this just goes back into the middle 1600s. As soon as they started uh, passing ordinances, acts, and statutes, what we call you know, legislative acts, one of the first things they did was to set up militia structures because, of course, they had dangers from the French and the Dutch and the Spanish and the, and the, uh, and the Indians. And you can trace through that hundred and something years worth of history the exact development of these structures called the militia of the colonies or the militia of the several states. And what you find is very short, very shortly after they began, they hit on a particular pattern that was workable. And this pattern was then followed in statute after statute after statute. It's amazing how many of these statutes there are. Probably more of that particular type of statute than any other particular type of statute certainly that I've ever run into because it was an important thing to maintain. And one of the principles of the militia was, and still is, because that term in the Constitution has never changed its definition, universal, or let me call it near universal compulsory service. The idea was that everyone in the community, and it was males at the time, not females, but that's changed for other reasons. Every able-bodied free male from 16 years of age up until 50, 55, 60 years of age was required by law to serve in some capacity in the militia. And that upper limit was based primarily on the physical disability. You got to be 50, 55 years of age, you simply couldn't perform, most people, the functions that were necessary, and it was unfair to require you to do that. Although you find, historically, uh, many of the people in that superannuated group were militia officers. If they could serve, they did. And on the other end, well, 16 years of age was considered to be uh, the age of maturity, unlike today, right, when it's, what, 18 or 21? 16 years of age, you were considered uh, 26 immature. If you, 20, it, until you're 26, you're considered a child under Obamacare. <laughs> well, 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 whatever, all right. But then, at 16 years of age, you could be given a gun or told to get a gun, actually is the way it worked, and be sent out possibly to be killed or maimed in the defense of your community. So that was the first principle, near universal compulsory service, and that included people such as uh, conscientious objectors, Quakers, Mennonites, the Amish, the the people who uh, were pacifists, basically. Uh, They were not required to serve in a military capacity, that is, with some kind of firearm, but they had to perform some other function, some non-military function. And in many cases, that involved them financially, in the sense that they might be required to come up with the money to buy guns and equipment for other members of the militia. So that actually was the second point. Everyone in the militia had to be armed unless you were a conscientious objector, and then you would have some other function to perform. And those arms were basically the same type of arms that were used by the regular armed forces, the British Army, the French Army, at the time. And that would be the infantry, a musket, Long, long gun, uh, bayonet, 
if you could get one, um, maybe a tomahawk, a sword, depending on the whole list of types of equipment, ammunition, lead shot, uh, powder, and they would list how much shot you had to have and how much powder you had to have and what type of a musket you had to have and so forth. And if you didn't have this within a certain period of time, then you were fined. And then you were called out on a regular basis for training. And if you didn't show up on a particular training day, you were also fined. If you didn't show up with the appropriate equipment, you were fined again. So they had a series of punishments to maintain uh, discipline in that respect. And what was the training? Uh, or the discipline, the organization was basically what was the military pattern of training in those days because the militia performed alongside of the regular British Army as kind of auxiliaries. Now, in many instances, the militia were also trained in you know, frontier fighting, Indian-style fighting. And in many instances, the militia were armed with guns that were actually superior to what the regular armed forces had, the, the couple of statutes that... In uh, 18, uh, 1784 and 1785, for instance, in, in Virginia, they specifically say that uh, militiamen who come from west of the Blue Ridge Mountains would use rifles. And why was that? Well, because they all had rifles. So the so-called Kentucky rifle was actually made in Pennsylvania, and then it comes down through Virginia before it ever gets to Kentucky. And these frontiersmen were using those rifles, and they were training in, in the use of those rifles in Indian fighting. And so the statute specifically gave them the authority as part of their performance of militia functions to use those rifles. So they were better armed than the average uh, British redcoat or, or French soldier, right? because they had rifles as opposed to smoothboard muskets. And as I said, you had tra training and disciplining that, discipline that was all set out in these statutes, and then schedules of fines and perhaps worse punishments uh, for people who... Uh, flouted or disobeyed the regulations. Now, what was interesting was the role of of the women in this. For various reasons, uh, cultural and legal, we, uh, women were not considered uh, to be subject to military duty. Now, obviously, if the Indians attacked the stockade and so forth, I mean, the women would be there with the guns if the husbands couldn't be. But in general, they were not subject to any kind of military duty in terms of actual performance in the field. So you didn't have women's battalions or whatever, women uh, functioning in that, in that manner. But they had financial obligations. And the classic example is a situation where you're dealing with a minor son. So this is a boy who's between 16 and 21. And he might be an apprentice, for instance, or servant in a family. And those people didn't make any money, a room and board, and they were learning their trade. So he didn't have the money to buy his musket to perform his militia service. Well, who provided it then? Well, his father, or his master, if he were a servant, was legally obligated to give this boy a gun so that he could perform the militia function and all of his, all of his other equipment as well. Well, what happened if the, the family didn't have a father? There's a, a widow. Widow had a couple of minor sons. She was responsible financially for providing that money. So the women had financial obligations. <clears throat> it also went to providing substitutes for, for the so-called watch in the ward, where they put people out to, you know, be in the watchtower protecting the town at night. And that was a duty that rotated through the militia, through the different families. And if it was a family that had no father and perhaps no son that could be sent then the widow was required to come up with the money to hire a substitute to perform that function when the duty rotated around to her family. So essentially, in one way or another, they had everyone involved in this system. And it was based upon the concept that everyone in the community had a duty to protect the community. You had to provide some form of personal service in that functional capacity. So that was what the Second Amendment was really about. And if you think then about, well, what level of armament are we talking about, and what is the relationship of government to that level of armament? The first thing we have to realize is the militia was a, a part of the government. The militia was not some separate group of private individuals out there. It was organized, structured according to various statutes. It had specific governmental authority, specific governmental duties. And as the Constitution now provides, the militia can be called forth to execute the laws of the Union. Well, 
It isn't private parties who execute laws. It's governmental officials of some kind who execute laws. So the militia really has a public official capacity. Most people don't even think about that. They think about militia in terms of a bunch of private guys now running around the woods in camouflage outfits playing soldier or something. It has nothing to do with the concept of the constitutional militia. So the militia were performing these particular functions in the security of a free state. And that brings us to another provision of the Constitution, which most people don't see has a relationship to the Second Amendment. It's Article 4, Section 8. Right. Article 4, Section 4 says the United States shall guarantee to every state in this union a Republican form of government. So every state has to have a Republican form of government. And by extension, of course, the United States are made up of the several states. So the United States must have a Republican form of government if all the states have a Republican form of government. Well, sometimes people think of a Republican form of government in, in a kind of procedural setting that, well, a Republican form of government is a, situ- is a system where the people choose representatives to serve mm-hmm. in various public offices. So you, you elect members of Congress, those are your representatives in the House and the Senate. You elect the president, he's your main representative in the executive branch. In some states they elect the judges. We don't under the federal constitution, but many states they elect the judges. So we have that process of representation as opposed to old-fashioned Greek city-state democracy or New England town meeting democracy where all of the eligible citizens got together and they would vote on every you know, issue that was put before them. But they didn't have representative right. direct democracy. All right? And our, our representative form of government it goes even beyond that because it says, well, it's going to be done pursuant to a constitution. There are limitations on what these representatives can do. They can only go so far because they've been granted these just powers by the people and they can't extend the reach of those powers beyond the appropriate construction of them. But there's a more fundamental uh, definition of a Republican form of government. And that is a government that is constructed on the principle that the supreme power resides in the body of the people. You go back to the Declaration of Independence, right? It's the people who form, change, alter, abolish governments. Governments have no existence in and of themselves. They are entire creatures of the people. And if you think of sovereignty as the ultimate political power, well, it could not exist in the government because the government is a creature of some body that has more power than the government, has the power of creation, and that is the people themselves. So a Republican form of government is one in which the supreme power resides in the body of the people. And now you think about the militia in terms of what I would call the first practical principle of sovereignty. It's that uh, aphorism probably most uh, remembered as having been written down by Mao Zedong of all people. Political power goes out of the barrel of a gun. Uh, sovereign in society disposes of the ultimate force in society. That's where you find sovereignty. What is the group or the individual, if you're talking about a monarch, right, a, a despotism, what is the group or the individual who controls the ultimate force in that society? That is the sovereign. And, of course, that was the king in England, right? He was the sovereign because, theoretically, his <laughs> word would dispose the necessary force to control all other groups and individuals within English society. Well, in our system, it's the people themselves. And if you think of the militia as composed of the people themselves, all of the adult, mature individuals, that's where the sovereignty actually lies in the final analysis. It's those now 50 entities in each of the several states And if you look at the reasons for which Congress is allowed to call forth the militia to perform services for the United States, execute the laws, suppress insurrections, repel invasions, that's a pretty good short list of the elementary powers of sovereignty. Repel invasions, you maintain control over your own country. Suppress insurrections, you prevent internal rebellions that would overthrow the rule of the people by setting up some kind of tyrant or despot. And execute the laws of the Union, you deal with criminals, whether those criminals are in private station or perhaps they might be in public office. And you look at that and you say, well, okay, I might add a few minor points to that list. But that list is 
a pretty fair encapsulation of the essence of sovereignty. And, of course, the militia are an armed body by definition, so the militia execute that ultimate force in society, so it ties it all together. And that, of course, is tied to the Republican form of government. It's interesting, if you look at the word, a free state, in the Second Amendment. That's kind of a peculiar way of putting it. Now, of course, they were referring to the 13 states that are already there. They certainly thought that all of those 13 states were free states. And they certainly thought that all of those free states had well-regulated militia, because they didn't change the concept of militia when they wrote the Constitution or when they wrote the Second Amendment. They were working on the basis of what was right. there. So this term, a free okay. state, looks a little bit peculiar. And I think if you know a little German... There is a German word that's pretty close to that. It's Freistaat. It's one word. Freistaat. Freistaat, and, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and a Freistaat is, well, literally, free, a free state. But the normal interpretation, the normal translation of that is republic. And the adjective Freistaatlich is republican. So you can see, maybe you think about this, a lot of those people probably had some vague knowledge of the German language, right, being, you know, Anglo-Saxon derived. And you can kind of see where that fit in, and you can see the tie. The Second Amendment, talking about a free state, well, it's talking about this thing called a Republican form of government. And it's saying that a militia is necessary to the security of a free state. Well, that means a militia is necessary, a necessary part of a Republican form of government. The United States has to guarantee a Republican form of government to every state. Therefore, the United States has to guarantee a well-regulated militia in every state. And, of course, Congress has the power to do that. Right there in Article 1, Section 8, Clauses 15 and 16, there are the powers. And the President, of course, is the Commander-in-Chief, so he can direct this thing towards the security of all of the states and the security of the United States as a whole. So it all ties together. Well, now when we come back to what most people are interested in today, those last 14 words. And if you listen to the uh, information coming out of the National Rifle Association, which I think is the biggest uh, proponent, certainly as far as the op opponents of the Second Amendment is concerned, they look to the NRA as being the, you know, the leadership figure among organizations. It focuses... I would say almost exclusively, maybe I don't even need the word almost, on those last 14 words. And it says, well, those words are concerned with what it calls an individual right, the individual right to keep and bear arms. That's what the Second Amendment is talking about as far as the NRA is concerned. And that boils down to the right of an individual to have a gun of his choice up to a point. I mean, they probably, they probably wouldn't agree with him having a, an artillery piece or something, but a, a typical firearm for personal protection. And the personal protection could be in his home, or it could be outside of the home, and we're talking then about you know, concealed carry of, of firearms, because they're very much in favor of uh, uh, concealed carry and having that right recognized throughout the United States. And, of course, the gun control people go in the opposite direction, and at extreme, they say, well, no one should have a, a firearm unless he's in the police or the regular army. And if he does have any firearms, they should only be the firearms that are allowed by, you know, some statute passed by Congress or a state legislature and approved by the courts. So there should be all sorts of limitations and uh, on calibers and types of ammunition and how many rounds can be put in a magazine and whether it's semi-automatic or not, semi-automatic, whatever. So the gun control people have this rather broad agenda. And it's interesting that neither one of them ever talks about the relationship of the militia to this. Because if you look at the militia concept, and this isn't a concept in the sense that it's up in the sky. It's there in the Constitution. It's never been changed. We have a mishmash of statutes that have been passed over the years that have made a mess of this. Because Congress and the state legislatures, and especially the courts, don't know what they're talking about. They never go back and look at the Constitution and say, well, wait a minute, what are we doing here? Does this really fit? the constitutional structure. But if you look at it from the constitutional perspective, you say, okay, what is, what is the second principle of the militia? First is universal service, so that covers all the people. So that means that a lot of these gun control statutes that exclude certain categories of people from the right to have a firearm or to have a certain kind of firearm or to have a firearm under certain circumstances, those are probably all invalid. 
And then, of course, the gun control statutes look to particular types of firearms or particular types of ammunition or magazine capacity or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, and they usually attack. I mean, the attack coming out now, especially on the AR-15 type rifle, mm -hmm. so-called black rifle, is, well, this is a weapon of war. This is akin to an M16. The only real difference is the M16 is fully automatic or burst fire, and the AR-15 type gun is only semi-automatic. Although someone who knows how to shoot the semi-automatic is not, he's not disadvantaged by that. Not to mention the fact that it's more economical to shoot it semi-automatic than full automatic. And that the Army and, I mean, I, I've got, uh, uh, contact with people in the Special Forces who will tell you that the training now is not burst fire of you know, full automatic. The training now is selective fire, mm -hmm. right? Uh, mm -hmm. Because I guess even the Army has learned that spray and pray is not a way to use that, those firearms. But in any event, the gun control people are attacking those particular guns because they are very similar in looks and function to standard military arms of the Army and the Marines and so forth. And they even call them weapons of war. We have to get the weapons of war off the streets, and, of course, the NRA on the other side said, well, these aren't weapons of war. These are the uh, modern sporting rifles. As if Hunting rifles, to... that's right. Yeah, yeah that's the terminology. Well, because they're trying to create a dichotomy here, favorable to them. You know, it's a language game they're playing. Okay? It's slogans and sound bites. And I find the, the NRA's position interesting because way back when, I think this was in the 1960s, after the Gun Control Act of 68 was passed, the uh, Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms Agency, came up with regulations about the importation of uh, foreign-made firearms, and they were especially concerned with pistols, with handguns. And regulation that came out at that time was, well, if, if these pistols didn't have a sporting purpose, because many of them were uh, surplus military or police guns from the various European countries, <clears throat> if they didn't have a sporting purpose, they couldn't be imported into the United States. And the sporting purpose was usually determined by what type of sights they had. Did they have the kind of sights that were usable for classic target shooting? And those were adjustable sights, basically, right? And a lot of these pistols that had been military use or police use, European, uh, had sights that probably weren't even useful for those uses. I mean, the little tiny sights on some of these guns were like an afterthought. So they couldn't be imported that way. And the NRA was very much against that. Hey, sporting purposes, you shouldn't be using that. You have no right to use sporting purposes. That's not right. So what do the gun importers do? Well, they ended up putting, making some cosmetic modifications to these guns and putting on some aftermarket sites that kind of looked like they might be useful in you know, target shooting. A lot of the guns were imported. But the NRA was not a proponent of this sporting characterization as determining whether a gun fell within the Second Amendment protection or not. But now it is. All of a sudden, it's discovered that that's the only way they can get around this weapons of war argument that the gun control people are promulgating. Now, what I say to the gun control people and the NRA is you're both fools. If you look at the militia, if you go to the militia concept, which is what the Second Amendment is really about, and we're talking about everyone is in the militia from 16, not just 18, not just 21, but from 16 years. You can't buy a rifle at 16 years of age in the state of Virginia. I'll bet you can't buy a rifle in most of the states in this country. All right? In many states, you can't buy an AR-15 unless you're 21 years old. You certainly can't buy a handgun unless you're 21 years old. All right? So we already have limitations that fly in the face of the historical definition of militia. But with respect to particular firearms, what were the militia required to have? They were required to have guns that were equivalent to or better than the standard military guns of that day. And the example I gave a while back in Virginia, with rifles. Those people who came from west of the Blue Ridge Mountains were better armed than the average infantrymen in the Continental Army or the British Army. The British Army had uh, you know, sharpshooters, Jaegers, a lot of them brought over from Germany with the Hessians who had rifled guns. Uh, so they weren't that far behind in that, in theory, but there were large contingents of the militia that were superior, and that was proven in the Battle of Saratoga, and it was proven in the Battle of Cowpens to give one from the north, one battle from the north, and one battle from the south. Uh, 
where the rifleman performed a very valuable function. So if you look at the militia concept with respect to what kind of arms are we talking about here, we're talking about arms that are basically equivalent to the military arms of the day. Why? Because the militia were designed to perform two functions, basically, at that time. One was to cooperate with their own army. That might have been the British Army for a long period of time, and then it became the Continental Army during the War of Independence. And then number two, to oppose somebody's army. And if you look at the history of the War of Independence, especially in New Jersey, New Jersey was a guerrilla area. I mean, they were fighting on both sides because you had some of the colonists were uh, for independence and some of them were Tories. They were uh, in favor of obtaining yeah. the B British control. Mm -hmm. And so that was a, a territory where the armies were going back and forth, Washington versus um, Clinton and so forth, were going back and forth fighting. Uh, but when the armies were someplace else, then it was these militiamen fighting among themselves. It was guerrilla warfare. All right. So they were performing that function as well. So if you think of the type of arms, you say, well, what kind of arms would the Second Amendment protect for anyone who would be eligible for the militia, 16 to whenever? Well, it would be whatever arms could be used for those functions. And that would start off with something like the AR-15, because that's the closest arm you can get to the Army issue and Marine Corps issue. It would probably include almost any handgun that you could imagine because certainly most of the semi-automatic pistols today are used by some police agency or some military establishment. Uh, certainly the revolvers would be included. Uh, they are considered, I suppose, suppose, by most people to be somewhat obsolescent, but they were certainly used in World War II and World War I, right, to a very large extent as military arms. I would include shotguns, for heaven's sake. Shotguns were used... The last time I saw a picture of them, they were being used in Vietnam during you know, the Vietnam conflict, probably still used today in some of these uh, guerrilla operations that are going on in the Middle East, to include all the shotguns. You might even think of guns like the Liberated Pistol. If I mention the Liberated Pistol, what does that mean to you? This is a little thing that was, it was, it, it was made out of sheet metal. It was stamped together by a, a division of General Motors, and it was a single uh -huh. shot, 45 caliber pistol, about the size of your hand. And it came with a couple of other rounds, and I think it had three rounds. And you could put the thing in, the round in, and you'd cock it, and you'd shoot it. And then you'd have to have a, they gave you a, a pin a, to push out the empty cartridge case, and then you'd load it again and shoot it. So it was a single shot, very primitive gun. And the idea was they were going to drop these to resistance fighters in France and so forth, in the various countries occupied by the Nazis. Mm -hmm. And the resistance fighters would use this simple-minded gun to go and shoot a German and get a, and get a better gun, get a rifle or a submachine mm -hmm. gun or something else, whatever, right? So even looking at those, you would say, well, now that would be a militia firearm because you could imagine a situation where some part of the United States might be invaded and taken over by an enemy for you know, temporarily, the army couldn't get back there to drive the enemy out. The only people that could deal with it would be the ones on the ground, they'd be the militia members, and this might be the only thing they had to perform their militia function, right, of repelling invasions. So it's very hard for me to imagine, if, if you look at the militia concept from a constitutional and historical perspective, that any of these gun control limitations could possibly be justified if you're dealing with the fact, the constitutional fact, that everyone from 16 on up, who isn't a conscientious objector, maybe who isn't really mentally ill, has been adjudicated mentally ill, because obviously those people would fall outside of the able-bodied char character that would be necessary. Okay. That all of those people would be entitled to this whole, you know, this whole spectrum of guns, any one of those guns that they would want to use. Now, they'd be required to have some. This is another thing that's fascinating. You know, the NRA wants yeah, yeah. people to, but it, you know, if you want one, get one. Well, other than the Quakers, the Mennonites, the Amish, the conscientious objectors, everyone would be required to have one and train with it, not to use it. So that in the worst possible situation you could imagine, invasion of the country, there would be a gun behind every blade of grass, as Admiral Yamamoto once supposedly said. All right, when he was talking about fighting the United States. And that was the whole concept of the militia, originally, and constitutionally it still is, that everyone would be armed and trained, 
and in the most dire circumstances, you could amass the entire body of the community in defense of the community. So all of these gun control statutes that we have now, the vast majority, and I, I can think of only a few because some of them you know, deal with people who are mentally ill, all right, let's, let's leave that aside for the moment. That has to be done very carefully because you, you can't simply adjudicate someone mentally ill without having you know, some very serious examination going on and legal protection. But in principle, someone who's mentally ill probably should not you know, be, be carrying a firearm. But leaving those people aside and leaving aside the conscientious objectives, everyone would be armed. Everyone would be armed at least with one firearm that would enable him to perform a militia function. In most cases, that would be something like an AR-15, at least be trained with those. And he might have any other arms that he wanted to have because there would be a lot of other militia functions that he might perform. So immediately you knock out the largest of the gun control categories. Then you get a cost to the magazine capacity. Well, the magazine capacity of the AR-15 in the hands of the military is, what, 30 rounds? That's kind of the standard capacity. Mm -hmm. End of discussion, right? Ammunition, well, let's look at all the types of ammunition the military uses. All of those would be allowed, and a lot of types of ammunition the military isn't allowed to use. Typical hunting ammunition that would have soft points and so forth and so on. Uh, so actually, I would think, <laughs> leaving aside machine guns, and I could make an argument for machine guns as well, but leaving mach machine guns aside for the moment, the militia would actually probably be better armed, more armed than the regular armed forces. They'd have what the regular armed forces had, then they would have a large selection of other things that the regular armed forces were not required to have. And I would rather like that. Why? Because ultimately the militia might be a counterweight against regular armed forces that ran amok. Right? <laughs> that was the whole point of the problem that the people in Massachusetts had with General Gage and the Redcoats. General Gage and the Redcoats were the legitimate, General Gage was the legitimate governor of Massachusetts, and the Redcoats were, of course, the legitimate British Army within the colonies, which were British colonies, right? And the militiamen stood up to them, Lexington conquered, and then after, because they believed that Gage and his military government and the Redcoats that were enforcing it were infringing on the rights of Englishmen, right? The Declaration of Independence, that whole operation. And that's why in the Constitution you see the militia are separate from the Army and the Navy. And the President... His status as commander-in-chief of the Army and the Navy is different from his status as commander-in-chief of the militia because it's foreseen that there is a possibility, maybe rare, but there's a possibility that those two entities or, or those two structures, because the Army and the Navy, let's forget the Navy. The Navy's not going to do this. The Navy's not going to oppress, any, oppress anyone. They're not going to sail carriers up the Mississippi River. The Army, that the Army would be an agent of oppression in the hands of, of a dictatorial government, or a government made up of people who had dictatorial aspirations. And the opposition to that would come from where? It would come from the militia. It would come from, from everybody the people, else. From the militia. Yeah, from the yeah. people. From the people organized in this governmental body. See, that's the in important thing. In this governmental thing. militia, got it. Right? The, the militia is a governmental and, body. So and the the, and the, the even, the word, even the words governmental militia send a uh, chill down the shiver of people who are, like, staunchly... Uh, pro liberty, that sort of thing. But you're pointing out that that's because they've become um, conditioned to not trust that the government is of the people, by the people, and for the people. So in this case, the uh, the governmental uh, coordination of the militia and regulator uh, re regulation of the militia, it's still a government that's of the people, by the people, and for the people. So it's an extension of an expression of the people. Well, that's exactly right. The militia of the government, and the militia of the people, and the people of the government. And the people of the militia, right? You've got a little beautiful circle. If we, and if we had these structures, I mean, I can go into a long history about how this thing was, uh, the, the structural aspect of the Constitution was undermined from 1903 on. But if we had. Well, we will have to have you back for that. Well, yeah, that's fine. I'm not going to have you back for that. My only point is, if we, if we had it, if we had it, we wouldn't have this problem that you just addressed. People would not be looking at a, the militia concept as something alien to themselves. They would not be looking at themselves as potential uh, adversaries of the government. If the government is of the people, by the people, for the people, however you want to phrase that, then the government is the people. You can't be an, an antagonist to yourself. Now, there may be 
individuals in public office who are acting outside of their constitutional authority. These people are enemies of the average person. They're, they're enemies of the whole system. Right? In many instances, they may be criminal. I mean, some of them may be done just for filthy lucre, but in many instances, it's a criminal conspiracy they're engaged in. And that's interesting enough to take us back to the militia concept. Congress can call forth the militia to execute the laws of the Union. Against whom? Well, there's no limitation. Against anyone. Against a common criminal, if there are enough of them that require the militia to be called forth. And perhaps against criminals in governmental offices that can't be rooted out any other way. You see, it all ties together. And it our does, problem and we've got we're gonna we're gonna have to um, to cut it off there. But uh, you you've opened up some some topics that we're gonna really want to circle back with you on because uh, you're you're bringing this to several points that we need to explore further with you. One is you talk about the undermining of the Constitution, how it is we became basically the average person uh, became divorced from from truly believing and experiencing that the government is an extension of the people. Um, you've touched on the point of uh, rights. The people focus on today is about the rights to bear arms, but they, we have, you've talked about the obligation and the responsibilities about training and so on and, and, and functioning in an organized manner. We need to circle back on that. So, uh, Dr. Vieira, we've, we've just got to get you back on. And, uh, and uh, if people want to find out between now and our next interview more of your work, where can they find you online? Well, they can go to News with Views. That's one word, newswithviews.com, and I'm one of the contributors there. They go to my archive. They can find a large number of articles that touch on the militia, short articles. They can also go to edwinviera.com. It uh, has some things that don't appear on News with Views, some things that are more detailed that don't appear on news reviews. And then for book length presentations or a couple of CDs that are out, uh, they can go to Amazon and look look me up, Edwin Vieira, and they'll find what I've uh, written and, and published in book form. And then I have a number of, uh, let me call them lectures, that are out on, on YouTube one way or another that people videoed while I was giving them. And if they put my name in and YouTube and you know, militia or something along that line, those things will those things will definitely come up. But the reading is in, in the books and the articles is pretty extensive. Excellent. Well, we've only I can tell we've only scratched the surface, but you've certainly opened our eyes. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of uh, interesting and uh, uh, enthusiastic uh, commentary and debate in the comments underneath this video because I think it's going to dispel a lot of conceptions that people have been harboring for some time and it, it actually opens up some very intriguing topics about what our responsibilities and our rights are and what's wrong with the very structure and function and form of our government if, it, if it's no longer perceived to be or in reality is an extension of the people. We've been speaking with Dr. Edwin Vieira, constitutional attorney and a researcher uh, and writer on the on firearms law at the constitutional level. Dr. Vieira, thank you with gratitude for joining us this first time on Reluctant Preppers. Thank you for the opportunity.